You're listening to the AVIT Amplifier. Each week, we'll feature voices and ideas that need to be amplified in the higher education and pro-AV IT communities. This show is brought to you by higheredav.com. And now here's your host, Ryan Gray. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for coming back. Uh, If it is Wednesday, you know that the show is going to be here with voices, ideas, or something that we uh, know that you need to hear, we promise. And uh, with without exception, we are back for week two, week two, number two with Britt Yenser. Uh, Britt, thank you for coming back to the show and uh, standing up to what is, um, I, you, I like to say, the, the most um, uh, 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 intense questionnaire in podcast area, but I think your yours is probably a little more intense than mine. So I, 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 will, uh, I will concede that to you at this point. Thank you, I accept. <laughs> So the last time we did this um, was early on in the show's run, and it was at Infocom, and it was literally like the last hour of the show, and everyone was exhausted, and people started trying to break down the podcast thing before we were even done recording. But I want to touch on a couple things that came out of that, which have had some staying power um, and some of the answers that you gave on there. And so I've, I'm, I'm going to go out of order a little bit. Um, but okay. one of the things, one of the questions that I, that I like to ask people is, what is your best life hack or pro tip? Do you remember your answer from the last time you were on? <laughs> yes, my best life hack or pro tip was to, when you are at a bar, ask the bartender for a blue drink. Yes, and how, and how many times have you seen that reference now in the past, you know, nine, ten months since, uh, since that uh, came out? A lot, and I love it. It's delightful. I am so glad that I have brought the um, beauty of blue drink to so many people's lives. I feel like, honestly, engrave that on my tombstone. That's my greatest accomplishment. <laughs> That's awesome. So I just love that because it, we st- it was that you know it was at the dinner that night where then we first started telling people that, and we started ordering blue drink that night. And and I will just share for me what I love is is beyond beyond just you know the blue drink is fun but that to me it is something i've thought of so many times which is trust the expert on the other that you're talking to don't tell them what to do right like you're a bummer say <laughs> just make something blue and i leave it up to you to make something good instead of prescribing exactly what to do and how much i wish people would do that for us in technology that really landed for me right because like isn't blue drink always good have you ever been disappointed exactly like yeah that person makes drinks every day let them go crazy let them do something that they know is good that they would and blue just always looks cool so thank you exactly look forward to uh whenever our next blue drink would be probably back at infocom so we'll see yeah we'll see how that goes okay so um one of the other things that you mentioned, and then we'll move on to some of these other things is that um is that you have written poetry and that oh, at yeah. some point you had a self-published poetry. So uh, one of the follow-ups I meant to ask at the time was, um, is poetry something you're still doing? You, you, you are, do some creative endeavors. You do a number of things. Is writing, or in particular poetry instead of prose, something that you're still engaged in? Or is it something that you used to do? It's at this point more something that I used to do. On occasion, a like phrasing will pop in my head and it will strike me and I'll put it in my notes app and maybe someday I'll like string things together and make something new. But like, honestly, I think that it used to be, it used to be more of a core part of my identity. Like I really identified as someone who wrote and I wrote this particular thing and it had a time and place in my life that I've kind of phased out of it in some ways. Um, that's not to say like never again, or I absolutely don't do that anymore. It's just less important to me now. Okay. And I think, it, it, do you think that, and this is a thought I've had a couple of times that like, I don't know, you know, I, that your social media creates a space for sort of like really short, weird, short form poetry, like a two line thing that rhymes, catches your eye more than something else, or even just a clever way of saying something in one sentence can be more impactful when you have to get somebody's attention in four seconds rather than, you know, seven pages of verse. 
Right. Yeah, we have definitely started to master the art of the short form. And I think that is part social media, part attention span shrinking. And those are definitely linked to each other. Um, yeah. And as a social media influencer yourself, how had you become so good at uh, short form uh, expression? Uh, I, I appreciate you saying that I'm good at it and that I'm an influencer. I don't really feel that way about myself. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't put a whole lot of thought into my social media, if I'm going to be honest with you. Like, I, I hop on there and I'm like, I said what I said. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's not, it's not really Wait, okay. conscious thought. We actually touched on this last time, but let's dive in because you just said it again. I don't think of myself like that. Well, the whole thing about social media is you're everybody else gets to think what they think about you, not the other way around, right. which is maybe right. good, good, good. But objectively, and I don't have them in my head, I wish I'd looked them up, but, uh, Twitter accounts with high levels of engagement, both at Infocom and at ISE this year, you're, well, you're in the top five, top 10 lists of those. So right. I don't think you can say anymore, I'm not a social media, like the numbers don't lie, Britt. You have a high level of engagement around our industry on social media. That's true. But so what I think is happening though, is not me posting a series of like impactful thoughts. It's like I post a thought and then someone responds and then I respond to them. And the way I use social media to me is like, we're making a connection, we're having a conversation. It's very authentic to me. And like when, to me just liking something or hearting something isn't really a response. Like I will actually write back to you you know, to say, like, I see that you said this. Here's what I have to say back. And sometimes what I have to say back is as simple as, like, a funny gif, right? But, like, mm -hmm. at least to me, I'm like, I am actively responding and acknowledging you. And that's genuine to me. Like, I really do want to do that and make you feel heard. And I think that that is where the, like, high engagement comes into play. Well, how dare you actually use social media for what we all say we use it for, but most people don't. How right, dare right. you actually I know. do it? How absolutely dare me? I know. I don't know. <laughs> no. So that's, I love, I, I hadn't planned on bringing that up, but I'm glad it went that way because that's 100% the case, which is it's not a one-way piece of communication for you as it is for so many people to put my mm -hmm. thing out there and it's a broadcast and and so if you really want to be an engaged social media person do what Britt just said be genuine with it be authentic with it and make yeah. an actual connection with person uh, with a person and it will be awesome all right see yeah. again practical advice you're going to get right off the bat okay um can you tell us about one of the best days of your life Wow. I think that one of the best days of my life was the very first time that I went to Disney World. So um, I that is not something I had the opportunity to do as a kid. And so the first time I went was as an adult with my husband and his family. And to me, it really did feel like literally magical. And like we checked in and they gave me like, it's my first time at Disney World pins. And I wore that proudly. I wore pretty yeah. much every day where I'm like, that's right. I finally did it. Um, <laughs> and it was like the ability to lean in to childhood wonder and magic and just like listen i know that's a person in a costume but i'm gonna act like it's really the character and i'm gonna mm -hmm. get like real excited about this like anytime that you can like lean into the um wonders of the world no matter how simple they may be that's uh, really exciting and fun i love that answer just as an adult embody that that thing i i you know having a kid who you know we did take to disneyland uh, younger and then as a teenager and then I've, I've had that thought like i think disney might be wasted on children especially and i know that's sort of a mean thing to say but like there's so many kids there at an age that it will be a fuzzy memory and really 
the experience is for the parent to see the reaction of the child rather than for right. the child themselves. That sort of messes with my brain when I've been there. It's been a long time since I've been to one of those that like, like who who did we actually pay this all this money for here? So I don't yeah. know. Any uh, any thought on that? I think that it definitely depending on the age of the child it can potentially be more for the parents to like watch the child's reaction and get joy out of that which there's nothing wrong with that right like yeah. you should find joy in being a parent <laughs> so like that's great i would agree um, yeah and like that's not to say that like kids don't like it at all we re the last time we went as a family i had my two young nieces along and they I could definitely see the wonder and excitement like they were enjoying mm -hmm. themselves um and i think like that is a common argument that people will make against taking young kids or they're like well they're not going to remember it anyway and it's like who cares like did they have mm -hmm. a wonderful day in that moment then it was worth it yeah i like that i like i like that too there's it's let it be what you need it to be or what's best for you and it's it's an immersive experience choose the immersive experience yeah. you want to, to get. okay um uh s smell sight touch now what sense do you trust the most I'm tempted to say sight because I feel like that's kind of an obvious thing, right? Like if I can see it, then I know it exists. Um, I'm hesitant to say that because one, my eyesight is terrible. So oh. how absolutely dare I <laughs> trust the thing of my body that doesn't actually work very well at all. Uh, and also like it kind of starts to eliminate the ability for belief, which is such a strong, powerful, important thing. Um, you know, like you, you, or at least I try to believe in something, even if I can't see it visually, mm -hmm. but I'm going to go with sight anyway. Okay. Do you, <laughs> one of the, uh, and I think that's a pretty, we're, uh, it makes sense. Humans are pretty sight dependent. It is something that has enabled our survival for a long time. So, but also sight is one of those senses that can deceive you. Yes. And a lot of work is done to, to, to deceive and influence people through subconscious ways that sight can be an overpowering sense. Is that mm -hmm. something that you know, it, I think it actually probably touches on a lot of things that you think about bias and other things that sight is the primary informational pathway to feeding in. So is that like, is there is there part of sight that we think we should be distrustful of? And does that create space for not only belief, but the the need to be skeptical of, uh, of, of what our sense of sight seems to tell us? Yeah, I think you have to ask yourself, like, what do I see in front of me right now? And what does that mean to me? And mm -hmm. what might that mean to others? You know, like, sometimes you got to unpack things, for sure. Yeah, I love I, uh, it's a, uh, the more I think about <laughs> those things, I really get into this weird place of like, no, that can't be trusted. That can't be trusted. Like, how if I really want to hear if I really want to know how somebody's feeling, am I better off? closing my eyes and listening for an intonation of voice because people are like how anyways that's a whole rabbit hole we could go down that uh that we could go okay so i, I came across i haven't asked this question yet before but i came across it and i put it in my list because i love it and i'm thinking i might use it another thing so if you you're say you're in a job interview and the interviewer, I'm, I'll ask you the question as the interviewer and you could say. So if we okay. bring you on to this job, but we're gonna end up having to let you go 90 days later, what's the most likely reason? What? <laughs> wait, 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 like, wait. So, for, all right, to clarify. Yes. If you were to let me go in 90 days, is the reason because of something I did or because of like something Better affiliated but... with the company? No, no, no. I, well, so I could go either way. Let's say, you know what I'm saying? I think the way I, I was reading it and thinking of it was 90 days in, you're gonna be fired. What's the most likely thing that's happened over those 90 days to mean that we have to part ways? Could be either thing, right? It does, that mm -hmm. doesn't have to be so what was wrong with you, but what would make uh, this not a fit? 
I think for me, value is not aligning with the company or institution. You know, like I, I hopped on a podcast and opened my mouth and they didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally, it's totally right. I, so I, um, I love that answer. And again, I don't want to, I won't talk, but like, um, uh, if you're listening to this podcast a couple of weeks ago, I, I go on a whole monologue about vacation time and time away from work and all this that like, there's so much about what I actually think that's available now out there that like, you know, I, I always wonder what, what that'll happen in the future, but I've got that same thought. The flip side to that is as a candidate, if the things I'm saying that I value, you don't want, then I don't want to work there anyway, you know? Right, exactly. Like, I, it's, and it's hard, like I am going to answer these questions honestly. And if that means you're not interested in me working here, that's probably in my best interest as well as their best interest. Yeah, you need to be able to show up as your authentic self. Yeah, so all right, then uh, do you feel like too many people think about their place of employment as a place where they put on a show? So there's a meme I love, which is, um, uh, and I'll say, I'll, I'll, I'll use a word that, you know, I won't mark the thing, but it's, it's a little song which, where you're getting dressed for work and the saying is it's time to start cosplaying as a person that has their shit together, <laughs> right? So it, it feels like a lot of the world treats employment that way, where I have to cosplay as somebody I'm not rather than a place I can be my actual self. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I definitely understand that. I'm sure I do that. I think we all do that to some degree at some point. We might not do it all the time, but like there are times where you just have to like put on the mask and go, but that does get very draining. So if that's something that you're doing mm -hmm. all the time, that's not good. Yeah, it's it you you cannot keep it up indefinitely, or if you try right. to, it will just grind you down. And I know as a younger person at a place in, you know, having when, you know, young kids and stuff, there were definitely jobs I worked at because, you know, where it was harder and it was grinding because it was providing something. But when you find the opportunities to get somewhere where values align, oh my gosh, it, it you, you will, as much as you need to provide that money, man, you'll be a better parent if you uh, aren't having to grind that way every day. Okay, right. uh, enough of Ryan's uh, lecturing on other people. So um, I know, and the answer to this may not be in that genre. I know you to be someone who enjoys old school horror movies, B level, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. that sort of thing. So what's a movie, and you, so you answered this question last time and so that answer is off the table, whether you remember it or not. Your answer was Buffy I do the not. Vampire Slayer. Oh, um, okay. But what, um, and that's all, that's because I went and looked up the uh, other answers. Uh, but in, in that realm of, so the question is, you know, what's a show or a movie that you can really quote, that you know and love and would advocate out? Is there something in that genre that is, with that a lot of people don't know that you would say, like, this is something you should watch because it will change, you know what I'm saying? You'll watch it and go, how was this thing flying so far under the radar? I don't think in asking that question that you understand what B-level horror movies are. There is not okay. a single B-horror movie in the entire world that someone would watch and be like, wow, I really got something out of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're right. I love that. Okay, so, well then what, then why, why, what is it for you that those movies provide? It's fun. You know, sometimes you just have to have fun and not, like, it doesn't always have to be deep, right? Like, yeah. there are days where I read nonfiction. I'm, I'm reading The Power of Habit right now, which I highly recommend. It's an mm -hmm. amazing book. But I also am reading Salem's Lot by Stephen King, Yeah. right? Like, like sometimes you deserve to just have fun you don't have to think all the time i agree with i love that i so for you what it is 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 an experience to watch and go that is just kind of you're, you're not in, you're not trying to experience it you are watching it as a as a i don't know how to put it like there you're literally self-breaking the fourth wall it's not about it's about what it is and an enjoyment of the almost like the watching of the train wreck that it is the you know yeah. experiencing of the story they were trying to tell 
oh yeah, most of them are hot garbage, but like that's what makes it fun. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I have uh, this is a thing that there's a I have it saved too. It's a somebody who made uh, they took the song. It's All Star. Hey, now you're an All Star by whatever that band was. Yeah. I can't remember. Smash and- Mouth. Smash Mouth. And they took all of the parts, the drum part, the guitar part, the bass part, and put them all one beat off from each other. So, you know, the thing starts with the vocal, somebody, and then that downbeat's supposed to happen and nothing happens. And then the drums come in one late and the guitar here. And it's, it turns into this cacophony of... And, and it it's it and it should drive you crazy but then if you just relax into it for a second it's like kind of the most amazing thing where it will it will take every other thought out of your brain because just listening to the train wreck is, the hot mess is part of the i love that as something that yeah. can clear your mind and give you fun and mental rest mm-hmm. i don't see there you go there you go uh, more um, more so then in that case do you at least have one that you could recommend to uh, to other people? Mm, okay, let me like dig deep into my. It's it's difficult for me because there are some things where I'm like, surely everyone has seen that one because I've seen it a million times, and right. it's like actually that's probably not the reality. Uh, I'll go ahead and recommend the Blob. Just straight up the Blob. Yes, because right. like I feel like that is popular enough that people who like horror have probably heard of it might have watched it but like it's older enough that Mm -hmm. like maybe you haven't and it is really fun uh it could it could maybe potentially make you think the way it ends if you want to think or you can just enjoy it (laughs) awesome love it i love it okay so let's tell us about your pets Okay, so I have a boxer named Swayze after Patrick Swayze. Mm -hmm. Uh, He is a rescue. He's about two, three years old-ish. And then I have a cat whose full name is Desdemona, but we call her Mona. Also a rescue, and she is like 10 or 11 years old now. Wow. Okay, so uh, Patrick, let's let's dive into Swayze from Patrick Swayze. Why? Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, We just, my husband and I both really love Patrick Swayze. We love his movies and his career. He was very much a renaissance man, just a fascinating person. Um, And Swayze is just a fun name for a pet. Like it's, and I've had to, so boxers are prone to every illness on the planet. Uh, He recently had an indolent ulcer in his eye, very common for boxers. And we had to take him to a doggy ophthalmologist yeah. Ryan, I could have gone my whole life without knowing that there are eye doctors <laughs> for pets, right? right? But here we are. Um, but I called to make the appointment and said his name is Swayze. And then the receptionist asked, can he dance? Yeah. To which I said, of course. Of you course. know, of course, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I, yeah, I love that. I did. Pet names can can change your whole day depending on the thing. And yes, uh, I bet he can dance. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Pets are an amazing investment of money, aren't they? You know what I'm saying? And but gosh, they're they're just worth it. Okay, so is there a following up on Swayze then? Would you agree that Patrick Swayze's best work was the Chippendale sketch on Saturday Night Live? No, only because I don't like it was Chris Farley in that sketch yeah. with him, right? Yeah. yeah, I don't like the way they treated Chris Farley. Um <laughs> so yeah, no. For for that reason, no. Um okay. I th- my personal favorite work is Roadhouse. Yeah, I know. That's a popular one with people. Yeah. I love that. Okay. And then your cat's name, short Mona, yes. but the, the, mm-hmm. the, the full name, what's the, what, what's the it's background It's Desdemona, there? which Desdemona. was in Shakespeare's play Othello, Desdemona was the wife of Othello. And so when I adopted Desdemona, the shelter had named her Miss America because (laughs) she was very like personable and like just very liked people like to be around like 
very odd for a cat, almost dog-like mm -hmm. behavior. And Desdemona in the play is described as being very fair, very beautiful, and like everyone likes her. So mm -hmm. it was like, you know, that's, I was, I was an English teacher at the time of Desdemona's adoption. So it made so much more sense at that time than it does now. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. You pushed it up market. You just took the concept and you just pushed it up market a little bit. That's an example. Like I can tell an entire story with one word as long as you know the reference. I'm mm. an English teacher. Do you know what that is or not? So, all right. Um, I, I, it, it, we've got a couple minutes. I want to tie that actually back to something we were talking about before because you mentioned in social media that sometimes your reply might just be a funny gif, right? Mm -hmm. And let us all clarify that it's gif, not jif, and I don't want to argue okay. with anybody about that. Fundamentally disagree, but go on. <laughs> well, now, now we have to, okay, cite, cite why it's jif. Because the creator of the format said that it is pronounced jif. It was choosy designers choose gifs or something like that. It was a pun on the pronunciation of the peanut butter. Yeah, but it stands for graphics interchange format. The G in graphics is hard. I, it's a GIF. Listen, I get that. But like the person who made it was trying to make a funny little pun. And I, I, I'm leaning into their pun. I'm accepting it. Great. Well, I'm also an art major and understand that once you put your art out in the world, it's no longer yours. It becomes owned by the audience and they get to define it as whatever they want it to define. Well, I choose to define it as GIF. <laughs> well, I say GIF. Hmm. All right, that was good. We had a little, we, you know what I'm saying? We, got, we brought a little tension there, an actual argument. That was We're good. making I, different choices. That's okay. We are. I continue to be right. And that's why you would be good as a board member of Hetma. See, is we, you can, you can, uh, we can disagree and still figure out a way yeah. to work together, I guess. Yeah, I won't shit talk you later. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now I think you will. Gosh, <laughs> darn it. I knew I walked into the argument. Okay, so what was my original? Oh, this is an actual thing. So you're talking about um, you, you can tell the story of a cat's personality with one word by tying it to a particular reference. And what I love about Jeff is that... I think you can do the same thing. You can do a very similar thing in social media, which is you can make a three sentence or a full out thought by bringing the correct reference in. As long as people may know the reference, it can leave you in a place of possible non-interpretation. But do you, when you're thinking about that, do you ever go like, oh, I could say this in three sentences, but I know that moving image that would say it better than that. Yeah, absolutely. And but I will say that is the one thing that I actually do put some thought into because I know before I was like, I said what I said, I just type my thoughts and go. But like, when it comes to like a visual image, well, it's called a visual moving image. <laughs> <laughs> right? I don't know. Um, when a it comes him? to that. No, all right. <laughs> When it comes to that sort of response, I do consider the original reference and like, you mm -hmm. know, where that came from and what one, whether or not someone might recognize that and two, like, whether or not that has aged well and like mm -hmm. is appropriate for the message that I'm trying to say or like the type of person that I am. And it's hard because like, OK, that may mean something to me because of my connection to it. But what about the person I'm saying it to? What about right. a myriad of third parties who will see it? And how does it it's yeah, that's a very it's I it's it's a weird thing and, and fulfilling because I feel like it brings a little of that feeling of visual art to mundane everyday thing that you have to think about the full uh, 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 communication triangle, the rhetorical triangle when you make those sorts of those sorts of things. OK. Thank yeah. you for that. So um, the, the, we have the same last three questions for everybody. And, and even though you're back for the same time, um, uh, we, that will be no exception. So uh, third to last question is usually what's a question that you wish would be asked but isn't. But you've already answered that. And your answer to what was it was, how are you? And yeah. for people to actually care about that answer. And I know that answering it on a podcast is different than answering it to a friend. But Britt, how, how are you? 
right? And so here's the challenge, because my default is to go, good. So like, while I, I said at the time, like, I desire for people to genuinely ask this of me and have a real conversation, like, it's actually very difficult to mm -hmm. then give the genuine response. Mm -hmm. And um, there's something I have discovered about myself. And this goes back to childhood upbringing and family. So when I was a kid, my grandmother lived with us um, throughout a good chunk of my childhood and she was from Italy. And there are parts of Italy where you do not um, share with others your good mm -hmm. fortune or tell them that you are doing well. And you do not accept a compliment from others unless they bless you first. Mm -hmm. And it's this idea of the evil eye, that if yeah. you were to tell others of your good fortune, that they, they could put the evil eye on you and now your good fortune goes away. Um, and I didn't realize how much I internalized that um, without like realizing that's what I was doing. But I feel like that's why when people ask, how are you? I'm like, I'm good, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Like. Oh, uh, well, things could be better. Sometimes I'm even like, things could be better, even if they're going amazingly. Yeah. Because, like, there's this internalized, like, I can't reveal that I'm doing well because they might hex me. Mm -hmm. No, and there's, so I, like... Do you like how I gave you a really long story without actually answering the question? Well, but that, I, but that is... Here's what I would say. That's a very appropriate way to answer that on something that is public. I think part of it is... Part of the point is asking that question here and now is not an appropriate place or time to ask said question. What is the relationship with the person? How, if you really care about the answer, don't ask it when you know they can't answer it, right? And mm. and I've thought a lot about that. That is, that is a common response. And I think people are hungry for people who truly wanna know how they are, but we rarely do it in a place and time where it can really truly be dealt with. And then the other side yeah. to it is, people have to be willing even my wife and I we have we've we've normalized a little like you know that it, it's okay for something to be wrong and for the other person to be like yeah I but I can't like now's not the time for me to unpack that thing you know what I'm saying like mm -hmm. I'm not I can't I can't tear that thing down and work it out right now that won't be good for me therefore it's okay to let it sit until there's a place in time we can that like right you know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, championing quality, you know, genuine engagement takes takes that kind of work. So, okay. But I, I hope in reality things are going pretty well. They actually are, yes. There we go. Okay. Second to last question is if people wanted to ping you and learn more about what you are up to, your show and your work and your myriad uh, things you're doing to advance uh, our industry, how would they find you? Yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn as Brit Yenser. I am on Twitter as Brave Brit. It's also a like public Twitter account that has my name on it. So if you go on Twitter and search Brit Yenser, you'll probably find me that way too. Uh, my podcast is Brave Space. That's on HigherEdAV.com and pretty much everywhere you listen to podcasts. I also write for HigherEdAV.com, so you can find my articles there. Yep. Plug higheredav.com. There's always content going up there, written media and otherwise. And I think it's going to be a really great year for Higher Ed AV. I think we're there's a lot coming on that front. So um, I agree. That's awesome. All right. And finally, and look at us over time again. Finally, final question is um, what is Britt Yenser's official drop the mic sign off phrase? I'm Britt Yenser, and perhaps you could help solve a mystery. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the AVIT Amplifier. Join us again for next week's episode when we'll welcome a new guest who you'll want to hear from. We promise. Your host has been Ryan Gray. He's on the tweeters at Ryan underscore A underscore Gray or find him on LinkedIn to connect. Please subscribe and give the show a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. This show is brought to you by HigherEdAV.com. The views expressed here are not necessarily those of our respective institutions, employers, or sponsors. Everyone hang in there, go easy, and we'll be back next week.